Hi guys, it is a blissfully rainy Monday here in uh, the drought plagued wasteland of South Austin, Texas. I'm happy to report Monday, that means it is February 11th, 2013, time for my regular Monday morning weekly roundup, the economic meltdown roundup where I go on here every Monday morning onto the Yahoo News finance pages uh, to survey what the mainstream media is saying about the continuing downfall of the U.S. economy. Uh, you have to look hard for stories, but even the mainstream media there's a few honest people out there, and I congratulate Yahoo News for sharing this with readers as an antidote to, no doubt, this, this line of horse shit we're going to hear tomorrow coming out of little dictator Obama's mouth about how wonderful this economy is doing. But this is a Monday morning reality check for evidence that the economy in this country and on this globe, despite horseshit evidence to the contrary, is heading directly into the toilet. <coughs> Which, of course, as I say every week, is good news for the planet. Bad news for economy equals good news for planet. So, while I am reporting on this bad news, this is actually an eco-Nazi's good news report but anyway so as I always do I pick out six stories and uh, I have a wide ranging group of stories here and uh, let's see let's just get right into it uh, now this was interesting this story appears appears twice uh, the earlier version of this story was was a statement the economy is much worse than the data show the economy is much worse and then what the editors at Yahoo News I guess did is they is they rewrote that headline into a question is the economy much worse than the data show uh, to, to put some doubt so you know my answer to this question. Okay, this is directly, uh, this is from the Daily Ticker. And I'm going to read the statement one. The, the economy is much worse than the data show. Okay, the Great Recession may have officially ended in June of 2009. Yeah, right. But many Americans are still extremely pessimistic about the economy. This is the conclusion of a national survey conducted by Blava Ruger's University. Anyway, uh, nearly 1,100 employed and unemployed Americans participated in the survey from January 9th to the 16th. Uh, here are some of the survey's key findings. Eight in ten Americans are skeptical that career and employment opportunities will be better for the next generation. Count me in. More than half of Americans say the economy will not fully recover for another six years, and 29% believe that the economy will never fully recover back to 2007 levels. Count me in with the 29 percent. 73 percent of Americans were directly impacted by the recession. Uh, individuals had either lost a job themselves or a family member or close relative had been out of work because of the economic downturn. Okay, majority of survey participants said college would become unaffordable for most young Americans. Now here's an interesting, 56% reported having fewer savings than before the recession. 
Now, I, I'm one of those who bucked the trend. My savings rate now is about 1,000, 1,000 percent of my annual income. Because I invested in silver uh, in 2008. Okay. 40% of Americans have had to borrow money from family or friends, and nearly 25% of participants said they have sought professional help for stress or depression. So there you go. Uh, the, the survey's data, quote, speaks to the scope, magnitude, and the persistence of the recession, says the study's author, it revealed a, quote, really depressing image of what is happening right now to many Americans. And so I say, I'm going to put links to all these stories so you can click, or you can go directly to the finance page and find these yourself, or I will put links to each of these stories if you want to dig a little deeper in the economic depression well, which is I'm getting ready to do here. <clears throat> this from an, and also from the Daily Ticker, economist Paul Krugman. U.S. still suffering depression conditions, not recession conditions, depression conditions. Okay. When Federal Reserve officials sit down today for their first policy-making meeting of the year, they should consider continuing e easy money monetary policy well into 2015, says Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman. So this is one of these guys who, who supports, you know, just printing more and more and more of these Bernanke Obama bucks. This limitless supply of printing money is printing our way out of this recession. He's the Nobel Prize winning economist, not this dumb hippie on a rock. So let's see what he says. Quote, if the Fed can convince people that it is going to keep the pedal to the metal, that still has some leverage on the economy, Krugman says. Uh, for you guys who don't know, uh, the, the Fed is saying it is going to maintain near zero low rates until mid-2015. Uh, so we will see. I guess they're meeting to uh, talk about that. Uh, the economy now needs all the help it can get, says Krugman, author of End This Depression Now. Okay, he says the U.S. economy is recovering, but slowly, and of course that's open to interpretation, but is still experiencing, quote, depression conditions. He says almost 4 million workers have been out of work for more than a year. We have not had anything like this since the 1930s. And there's a lot of unused capacity, a lot of savings that have nowhere to go, huh? That's in direct contradiction with the last story I just read about people's abysmal savings rate. Uh, then, of course, here you go. This, this boils it all down. Quote, a growing economy is the best solution to all our problems. There you go, says Krugman, also an economics professor at Princeton University. And uh, I will leave this story here with, with this comment. Uh, all our problems. Uh, well, he conveniently, conveniently, like all of these other Nobel Prize winning Princeton economics professors, totally oblivious to the environmental ecological limits that this endless growth model, global economic 
endless growth model, these limits from Mother Earth that this model is running into. There you go. All our problems. Maybe, uh, maybe the the Nobel Prize winning economist should uh, Google maybe climate change, global warming, overpopulation, global famine, global water shortages. Uh, anyway. But this is my rants for the other six days of the week when I get to the deep end of the doomsday prophecy pool, which is the global environmental economic collapse that the Paul Krugman model of limitless economic growth is going to bring to this planet. But I will leave that for another day. All right, and let's just, uh, okay, let's uh, just jump around here into some, uh, I don't know how related or all this stuff is here from CNBC. Currency war, how to hedge it with gold. Okay, now guys, I admit I, I am a dumb hippie on a rock. Okay, even though... I have real estate licenses in three states, a five years of college training, and supposedly a 148 IQ. I have to admit, I am unclear what these currency wars are all about. I, I have some vague notion of what the term means, but there, there's links to about a dozen other stories about these ramping up currency wars going on on this planet. And so I, I guess I'll just take the word for it. There are people who know a hell of a lot more about it than I do, uh, about how all of this, the ultimate result of this, an oversimplification, is that the sooner or later, the U.S. dollar is going to go down the toilet. And as it does, your single best protection for this is investing in precious metals. It's not so much as, as an investment as just to be your new safe money. It is your safe haven from these. Now, the, the, so despite the fact that gold and silver are going straight down today as everyone swallows all of this horse shit about how healthy this economy is. Anybody with a brain looking just a few months down the road can see what is coming up, what the ultimate effect of these currency wars is. So anyway, uh, let's see uh, what, what, what this article has to say. As leaders from around the world meet this week to discuss fears of competitive currency devaluations, analysts told CNBC the currency war could lead to a sharp rise in gold prices in the second half of this year after a fall off in the first half, and I'm and I'm going to throw uh, take the liberty to throw silver, the poor man's gold, into this. Okay, quote: We think a currency war will be the biggest story of 2013 when we look back on this year. That was Patrick Armstrong, managing partner in Armstrong Investment. Uh, Currency devaluations will be on the agenda as the Euro Group of Finance Ministers meets on Monday. Uh, that's uh, going on today. Uh, Armstrong said gold always does very well when there is bad news. Quote, the G20 meeting, I think, is going to focus on what people are doing with their currencies trying to gain an edge, gain an edge in the global economic marketplace, that is, with currency manipulation. Whenever that is the backdrop, gold has a place in your portfolio, he said. So, uh, anyway, 
uh, this is this article goes on and on uh, and then as I say it uh, has all sorts of links that I need to read about these currency wars has China quietly joined the current sea war here's another one big bad currency wars uh, here's one the fuel of a currency war uh, here's one currency wars return 1930s style uh, it goes on and on uh, all of these is I need to I need to spend some time on this rainy day educating myself exactly what the hell these currency wars are that are ramping up to be the single biggest economic story of this year I right, let's lurch from there over to uh, let's let's peek in at what's going on in in Detroit with my my friends the automakers the gas sucking automaker industry this is from Reuters news auto nations chief warns of reckoning for autos and US economy there you go Reuters news okay the US auto industry and the nation's economy face a reckoning despite recent gains in economic growth in vehicle sales both fueled by stimulus programs you know being artificially propped up by these Bernanke bucks uh, this is according to the head of the largest US auto dealers group Mike Jackson he is chief executive of Auto Nation Inc Okay, he predicts that auto sales will not suffer in the next few years as the big reckoning is, is a decade away. All right, so he is looking into the future. What does he see? Quote, there is a day of reckoning coming for the U.S. economy and for America. Uh... Jackson said those who would dismiss his gloominess need only recall that he made similar dire warnings between 2004 to 2007 right before the US auto uh, market slid to a 28 year low in 2009 um, so there you go. So where of uh, where are we with U.S. auto sales? Okay, there were 14 and a half million gas-sucking cars sold in the U.S. last year, and most forecasters say auto sales will reach between 15 and 15 and a half million this year. Uh, all right, Jackson said that the federal monetary policies uh, that you know this last guy was cheering on he says the federal monetary policies of low interest rates and sharp increases in the balance sheet of the Fed are two major stimulus efforts that may come back later to haunt American consumers uh, anyway, uh, you can find more on this link. And then let's jump from Detroit. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I guess this is all over the United States. Uh, this is also from the Daily Ticker. Uh, this is from somebody, I guess some economist maybe, I don't know what she is, Marion Nestle. Uh, Americans are not just fat, they're hungry too. All right. Obesity is a national epidemic and deservedly gets a ton of attention from politicians, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the focus on fat has covered up another 
very real crisis, hunger in America. Between the record numbers of Americans on food stamps, which is now around 47 million Americans, and another two to three million who don't qualify or don't collect, quote, food insecurity, food insecurity affects about 50 million Americans today, according to journalist and author Peter Pringle, who's written a book, I guess, called A Place at the Table. Uh, and then he goes on to quote the noted food blogger Marion Nestle, author of Food Politics. So I guess Pringle and Nestle were interviewed uh, by this uh, by this writer here, uh, and they're putting together a full forthcoming documentary. So this is just kind of what you're going to find. All right. Quote, what is interesting is that the same people who are hungry are also obese, uh, Nestle notes. Quote, it is one of the great anomalies of our food situation. It, food situation. The fact is, if you do not have much money, you're going to buy food with as much calories as you can possibly take in. And the cheapest food of all is often junk food. And Americans who consume junk food are both fat and malnourished at the same time. And so, uh, going back over to this Pringle guy, quote, the ones you see in lines outside of soup kitchens, they don't look as though they're hungry most of the time. Uh, Pringle notes that lines at soup kitchens and food pantries get much longer the third week of the month because food stamps don't provide enough money to buy groceries to last a month. Uh, and Nestle argues that food stamps never were designed to take care of everybody's food needs for the entire month. Uh, quote, we need jobs that pay a decent wage so people can afford to buy their own food. We need to restructure the economy in order to take care of this problem and not leave it to private charities to try to fill what is a very large gap. Uh, so I will not weigh in with my opinion on that. I, I weighed in with my opinion a little bit on my rant last night about the, the, the need for an immediate, uh, the immediate need for a global mass sterilization uh, program where one of the people they interviewed was this fat white trash woman out there in San Francisco living in a homeless shelter with her fat ass husband and her fat ass she did she have two or three kids already okay they're on food stamps they're living in a homeless shelter they, every damn one of them uh, looks like a porker and, and uh, what are they doing they're popping out another another little bundle of joy so the US taxpayers and this planet can feed another this little fat face. Anyway, that's all another rant. You can go listen to that one. You can imagine the love letters I'm receiving with that one. Okay, guys, that's five down. And uh, I guess we'll finish this story, which has implications a lot bigger than the economy. Uh, I've been. Uh, I'm going to do a bigger rant about this, but this is just the. This is just looking at the economic impacts of this story, which is this. Uh, also from the Daily Ticker. <clears throat> China is America's number one cyber threat. As I say, I need to work up some bigger rants about cyber threats. I'm trying to get my buddy who knows a lot more about it to come do this rant on this rock. Okay. A new report by the National Intelligence Estimate 
confirms that China is America's biggest cyber threat. Gee, what a surprise. The report is classified, but insiders with knowledge of the findings spoke to the Washington Post. So this is this this story on the Daily Ticker is relying mostly on this Washington Post article, uh, which says, quote, from the Washington Post, the United States is the target of a massive, 